Emma Camp is a 22-year-old senior at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, home of Thomas Jefferson. She calls herself a liberal. She's often written opinion pieces for the school newspaper, The Cavalier Daily. Back in October of 2020, Ms. Camp had some strong things to say about the First Amendment. She wrote that it does not exist to protect reasonable opinions. It exists to protect the offensive and the unpopular. In 2022, she moved her opinions to a national platform, the New York Times op-ed page. We asked her to tell us what is behind her statement. This is a quote. I went to college to learn from my professors and peers. I welcomed an environment that champions intellectual diversity and rigorous disagreement. Instead, my college experience has been defined by strict ideological conformity, unquote. Emma Camp of the University of Virginia, senior, graduating this year. Why did you write the op-ed piece for the New York Times? And at the same time, how did you get it in there? So I think I'll start with the latter part of that question. Um, and first of all, thank you so much for having me. Um, this is a really exciting opportunity, and I'm glad to speak with you today. Um, but yes, yeah, so how I came to write it is that I actually got an email out of the blue from a New York Times editorial assistant. I had done a little bit of First Amendment activism earlier in the year, and she had seen some of it on Twitter. And then she read some of the things that I wrote for UVA's school newspaper. Um, and she really liked them and said, hey, we're looking for some early career writers. You should consider pitching for us sometime. And so I did. Um, and the reason why I decided to pitch this particular piece um, really has to do with, one, I like writing about issues relating to free speech and free expression. This is just kind of an issue I've been interested in for a while. And then part of it is that what I felt like I as a student was kind of qualified to speak about. Obviously, I didn't think I was qualified to speak about, say, like legal issues relating to the First Amendment. Um, but kind of the, the cultural element of free speech. So it's one thing to have really good, robust legal protections for free speech. So, for example, at UVA, it's a public university. UVA has really good kind of free speech protections. They will not punish you for saying something protected by the First Amendment. At the same time, when there isn't a cultural value of free expression, when the cultural environment doesn't value free expression, they don't value diversity of thought, it really keeps people from using the rights that they have. And I think that's a really big problem, particularly when it comes to colleges, where at least I, maybe being a bit of an idealist, would hope that the purpose of a college education is to kind of broaden your horizons, to think about things you hadn't thought about before, to examine ideas you haven't thought about before. And when you don't have a diversity of thought, you really can't fully capture that. What kind of reaction did you get from your op-ed piece? Um, I got quite a big reaction, a larger one than I was anticipating, that's for sure. I believe at one point the name Emma was trending on Twitter. <laughs> I also think Barry Weiss was trending on Twitter because enough people were comparing me to her. Um, so I, I certainly wasn't expecting the outsized reaction. Of course, it was a lot of kind of hate comments on Twitter, which is, of course, to be expected. You know, there was some kind of constructive criticism, but it was a lot of kind of ad hominem attacks a lot of kind of vulgar memes about me in a way that surprised me, but I think also kind of showed that I have a little bit of a point. You know, I, I made this claim that is a bit outside of the ideological meme for, or mean for a place like Twitter or elite college campuses. And then I had this massively outsized reaction, you know, people calling me a Koch brothers funded mouthpiece of the far right because I took a summer internship that paid me $10 an hour with a civil liberties organization, things like that. Um, I was also really pleased with the positive reaction it got, um, but I certainly was kind of shocked by the intensity of the negative reaction as well. Where did you grow up? So I grew up in about 45 minutes outside of Birmingham, Alabama. Um, and this was a really, I think, formative experience for me in a lot of ways. So growing up, my parents were ardent Democrats. You know, it was a special treat to get to stay up past my bedtime to watch Rachel Maddow. Um, but I also went to a school where pretty much everyone were very religious and very conservative. 
and my family was neither of those things. But what that taught me is, A, to be able to defend my beliefs well from a young age. I was never the kind of person that uh, wanted to self-censor all that much. So I can remember being in third and fourth grade and arguing with my classmates about how Obama isn't a Muslim and he was born in the United States, things like that. But also I learned to get along with people who have different beliefs than me, you know, until I was 13 or 14 when I ended up going to a magnet school in Birmingham itself. Uh, If I wanted to have friends, I had to get along with people who thought really different things from me. Um, And I think that was a really valuable experience that very much kind of molded the person I am today. Broad question. What's the difference in the atmosphere in Birmingham, Alabama, and the atmosphere at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville? I think that's kind of a hard question to super well identify because the time I spent in Birmingham, I wasn't in college. Um, I think high school environments are very different. I also went to a fine arts magnet school, so that school is probably the most liberal-leaning school in the state. I'm sure, you know, a student attending a typical public school in Birmingham probably wouldn't have the same experience. Um, But I think there is certainly a lot more ideological diversity in Alabama. Um, I think there is obviously a lot more people who lean conservative. You know, it's just the different makeup of the state and also You know, Virginia is somewhat of a swing state, but the kind of Virginia students that end up going to UVA tend to come from more liberal leaning areas of the state. Um, So I I think like the main difference in terms of the educational experience I had prior to coming to UVA versus UVA is that there was, I think, a lot more respect for and interest in ideological diversity. The New York Times piece, uh, which ran on March the 7th, or at least the one copy I have says that, and I have a digital copy, and I'm going to read the headline and, and get you to react to it. I came to college eager to debate. I found self-censorship instead. Did you write the headline? And if you didn't, what did you think of it? What's it mean? I did not write the headline. Um, And to be frank, I don't like the headline very much. I don't think it does a good job of capturing what the piece is really about. Um, I'm not even sure if I say the word debate in the entire piece. Maybe I do. But if I did, I think I probably used it as a synonym for discourse. Um, And I didn't really think of the piece as a personal essay, which the headline kind of makes it out to be. I didn't really write it about myself. I wrote it about kind of a larger phenomenon that I think is affecting most colleges in America, and and certainly at about half at least of college students. Um, So I think that's why I didn't really like the headline. It also made it seem like I was reporting that I self-censored a lot, which I really don't think I do. The one bit of personal experience I shared in the essay was about a time in which I, in fact, didn't self-censor and had this kind of outsized reaction to that. So I'm, I'm not, I'm personally not a big fan of the headline. I think there were a lot of people on the internet who only read the headline and reacted to that. I think I prefer the headline in the print edition much better, and the headline for that is Self-Censorship is Stifling Campuses. I think that does a good and straightforward job of describing what's in the essay. I'm going to just read the first two paragraphs and then have you expand. Um, You start off by saying, Each week I seek out the office hours of a philosophy department professor willing to discuss with me complex ethical questions raised by her course on gender and sexuality. We keep our voices low as if someone might overhear us. Hushed voices and anxious looks dictate so many conversations on campus here at the University of Virginia where I'm finishing up my senior year. Explain uh, what you're saying there. So what I'm saying there is that I started noticing really this year, but a bit last year, um, this kind of trend where any time someone I was with, we some something kind of ever so slightly outside the kind of accepted range of political beliefs at UVA, which are frankly very left-leaning. Um, but there, there would be this kind of anxiety that would occur. Um, and, and, you know, we would talk about things that should very much well be within the Overton window. And then, you know, I, I'd be talking with friends and then all of a sudden they would start kind of looking over their shoulder, worried that someone would walk by and overhear us and they would maybe start shutting their bedroom door. And that, really kind of shocked me, but I also immediately understood why that was happening. Um, And that's because at a lot of colleges, the last thing you want to be is caught saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. And of course, the huge problem with that is that if you're constantly worried about saying the wrong thing, you're inherently worried about thinking 
the wrong thing. And so what ends up happening is I think a lot of college students end up closing themselves off to kind of the range of ideas that they should be considering, which also makes them worse at arguing for the beliefs that they do have, right? If you hold a belief, but you have no idea what the arguments are for, what the reasonable arguments are for against it, um, you end up really struggling to defend the things that you hold to be true. Um, And so I I think that's just a really negative trend on college campuses. And I think it will end up affecting the ideological growth of college students or intellectual growth of college students, rather. You refer to a fellow student by the name is, you can tell me the exact pronunciation, Stephen Vichek? Wiechek. Wiechek. It's Mm W-I-E-C-E-K. Here's where your your debate word is. Stephen Wiechek at our debate club. He's an outgoing, formidable first-year debater who often stays after meetings to help clean up. He's also a conservative. At the University of Virginia, where only 9% of students surveyed describe themselves as a strong Republican or weak Republican, that puts him in the minority. Why did you bring him up? Well, I was looking for a quote and a perspective of a student who is ardently conservative. Uh, The other student I interviewed identifies as liberal, I identify as liberal, and I kind of wanted to see like what the environment is like for someone who has these like even more explicitly unpopular beliefs. Um, and so that's why I ended up talking to him, and he, he's a good friend of mine. Um, he would always, some, I, I find him to be a very kind person. You know, when I would, uh, we have these meetings and there's often food, and even when he didn't have to, he would always stay and help me clean up and help me take out the trash. And I, I found that to be really wonderful. And I get along with him really well. And we also disagree on so, so much. Almost every time I meet him, we end up kind of arguing about something. But it's good faith arguing. It's arguing where we're smiling and laughing the whole time. Um, and I think that's really important. And it really kind of saddened me but didn't surprise me to see the kind of experiences that he's had at UVA where he's really not been able to be the person he is around a lot of people for fear of this kind of social shunning. Is that, is that, I mean, tell me why he feels that way and how much of that is self-censorship as you referred to in your piece. Um, I mean, I think why he feels that way is that's kind of the realities of the situation. I think for a lot of explicitly conservative students, there is very real and intense backlash for holding those beliefs. So a good example, there was a, um, a student at UVA named Nick Cabrera. He is conservative and he was elected as a student council representative at UVA. And after it was revealed, I think he had a pick a selfie with Marjorie Taylor Greene, I believe. Um, student council almost expelled him from student council. They, they tried to kick him out of the leading organization of students at the university for having the wrong set of political beliefs, which is mind boggling, right? Someone who was duly elected by the students at UVA, um, the leading organization tried, they they failed, but very nearly uh, expelled him from the organization. Um, And so that's an example of kind of the heights to which conservative beliefs are punished at UVA. Um, But even more kind of individually, I think that we have a tendency to view people as the sum total of their political opinions. And I I think I used to think that at one point in my life, too. But I think I realized the more friendships I made with people who believe radically different things than I do, that as it turns out, like, the thing that makes up who a person really is, is very rarely who they voted for and, like, how they think the best way to handle certain political problems is. It's, It's far more about how compassionate they are, how willing they are to listen, what kind of music they like, you know, things like that. That, that makes someone kind of worthy of, of friendship. Um, but unfortunately, I think an appreciation for that is, I mean, I think it's deficient in our culture as a whole. I think as humans, we have a nature towards tribalism, right? But I do think it is becoming more and more pronounced on college campuses, unfortunately. How often do you find microaggressions or trigger words on the University of Virginia campus making uh, a controversial moment. Uh, can can you expand by what you mean by that question a little bit? Not really. I just I I 
<laughs> my, my producer is laughing here. <laughs> the reason I ask it is that we hear these words relative to universities now that that people are offended by certain trigger words and that microaggressions are a serious problem. And I'm looking for you, as someone who hasn't been in college for a lot of years, to describe what that environment's like today. So are you looking for me to say how often I... I see microaggressions happening or kind of like quote unquote triggering things happening. Yeah. How often does this create a controversy at the University of Virginia? If um, ever? I, I think it's the things that create big controversies are usually not allegations of microaggressions that they have in the past. Um, in terms of actually happening, frankly, I don't look out for them very much. Um, I I don't like it's just not something that I think about that often. Granted, I will note that like a lot of the talk about microaggressions is around like racist microaggressions. I don't really look out for those. I'm I'm white. Like that doesn't really seem to be a thing that if it did affect me, would affect me. Um, but I I think in terms of allegations of of microaggressions, yeah, it, it's normally the things that create controversies are alleged to be more severe than that. Although I I do remember there was recently an incident where. There was a large kind of group chat of students at UVA, has about 3,000 members, I believe, um, in which a student, basically we have a single, well, not necessarily anymore, but um, there was a referendum on our honor system that was coming up. And one of the reasons someone put in this group chat, vote in favor of this proposed change, because there are a disproportionate number of uh, students of color who are brought up on honor charges. And someone in the chat asked to see the data, and she didn't. She brought up what she perceived to be some issues with the data interpretation. Um, and that was basically the extent of her pushback. And then suddenly, I, I remember looking in this group chat, there were probably hundreds of messages decrying her, people calling her racist, people calling her a white supremacist. Um, she all of the like social media at UVA was kind of exploding about this one person. And she really got kind of mercilessly dogpiled for saying something that doesn't strike me as particularly heinous to essentially say, well, there might be some issues with the data here. And then all of a sudden I, I have screenshots of the messages. It, it got really intense. At one point, someone made a joke about her being killed and found dead in a ditch. Um, and so I think that might be a good example of something that would probably be classed as a microaggression causing a controversy. But I think a lot of the people uh, who are kind of dogpiling on this person probably perceived it as worse than a microaggression. What's your major? Uh, philosophy and English. What are you going to do with that? I'm going to work as a as an assistant editor at Reason Magazine next year. Why Reason? Um, I really like the work that they do. I think they publish really good, well thought out journalism. You know, as someone of a left libertarian, I appreciate their commitment both to, you know, civil liberties, but also to kind of that they kind of resist both sides, both typical, you know, left or right dichotomy. And I really like that. Um, I go to them for a lot of kind of good, clear takes on current topics. Um, and, you know, I, I frankly think that they're one of the only outlets that would allow someone like me to write the kind of things I want to write right now. Something I've thought about is, you know, if I had a job lined up at a similar outlet, there's a very good chance that um, after all of this online reaction to my piece, I would be out of a job, right? If, say, I had been hired by Slate or the New Republic, I think there's a better than not chance that um, enough people on Twitter would have tried to get them to fire me, and they, in fact, would have fired me. Um, but reason stood by me. Of course they would. This is something that's very much in their wheelhouse, and I got a lot of support. Um, from the staff there, and I'm very grateful for that. When did you learn that Reason even existed? Um, I learned about it last year when I was interning for FIRE. FIRE has this kind of email that they send out with um, kind of relevant uh, news articles to their mission, and a lot of stuff from Reason started coming up, and I started reading them there, and I really liked the kind of coverage that they had. FIRE stands for Foundation of Individual Rights and in Education. Where is it? Uh, why is it there? What does it do? And why did you internship with them? So it has offices in Philadelphia and D.C. 
Um, and what it's really there to do is to be kind of a First Amendment slash free expression rights kind of civil liberties organization focused on college campuses and college students and faculty. And so the main thing that they do is they protect students and faculty who have been kind of unjustly punished for protected speech. So, for example, if your college punishes you for saying something protected by the First Amendment, if you're a faculty member and you're fired or disciplined for saying something protected by the First Amendment, which, as it turns out, is the vast majority of things you can say, the overwhelming majority of things you can say, in fact, um, they protect you. They might sue the school on your behalf. They also might um, send a letter to the school. They also lobby schools to make better policies. So most colleges have speech codes that are not in line with the First Amendment. Private colleges technically can have these, though fire encourages them not to because free expression is so valuable. Um, but public colleges legally cannot have speech codes that are not in line with the First Amendment. But as it turns out, most of them do have speech codes that violate the First Amendment. And so a speech code that does this might be something that says offensive speech is not allowed. You know, you'll get punished for saying something offensive. Offensiveness is protected by the First Amendment. Um, and so they do a lot of really good work in that realm. They also do some reach, um, outreach to college students to kind of encourage them to, I suppose, fight the good fight. Um, and the reason why I interned for them is that this is a topic that interested me. So actually how I really got into it is that my roommate in my second year of college had interned for them the year before. And we ended up talking about First Amendment issues together and realized that we had a lot in common. And so I went to, they kind of have student um, conferences and I went to one of those and I got very into it and it just became an issue that I cared a lot about. And so I applied for the internship last year and I got it. And it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. I'm sure you know about the Chicago statement on the First Amendment, but I'm going to read yes. just a very small part of this. This is the University of Chicago. Because the university is committed to free and open inquiry in all matters, it guarantees all members of the university community the broadest possible latitude to speak, write, listen, challenge, and learn. It is not the proper role of the university to attempt to shield individuals from ideas and opinions they find unwelcome, disagreeable, or even deeply offensive. What do you think of that? It's awesome. I love it. I want. I wish every college in America adopted a statement such as that. There are some 80 institutions that uh, supposedly follow this, but I want to run for you. It's about two minutes long. Uh, from a podcast I did earlier with a professor at the University of Chicago, John Mearsheimer. He's not talking for the university. Mm -hmm. He just reacted to some questions I asked him about censorship, and uh, I want to get your reaction to what he has to say. He's been there for 40 years. He teaches international affairs and political science, and his name again is Professor John Mearsheimer. Self-censorship is... Uh, rife at every university and college in the United States. Faculties are remarkably liberal. Political center gravity is far to the left. Uh, and students understand the importance of getting good grades and uh, getting letters of recommendation from faculty members, uh, almost all of whom are to the left of center, uh, and, and therefore they stifle themselves. Uh, this is well documented. And I've talked to enough students about this that... Uh, uh, when I read an article on it, I find it hardly surprising. Chicago is known for being a leader in the free speech movement. A lot of universities follow their uh, code, uh, but a lot don't. And w what would you say about what's happening across the country in these universities where a lot of people on the right can't stand the universities, can't stand professors, don't like tenure? Uh, I've even heard one particular young leader suggest that kids shouldn't even go to college because of it. Well, I, I, just on the University of Chicago, I think the University of Chicago is the best place on this issue. Uh, I mean, we have a rich tradition of freedom of speech, and uh, and we're, I think, clearly better than most other places. But even here, there's a problem. There's no way you can avoid it. Uh, it, it it's a widespread trend. Uh, and many of the people who come here uh, to occupy teaching positions were trained at other universities and they bring uh, 
their mindset from other places here. Uh, so this place is not that different, in my opinion, uh, than most other universities. It is different, but not that different. Uh, I can understand why a lot of people are very angry. Um, and uh, they believe that, uh, uh, that universities are, are not open to people who are on the right and that there's something fundamentally wrong there. Uh, and uh, I think there is a large element of truth in that. Emma Camp, your reaction? Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly um, with what Professor Mearsheimer is that what you said? Yes. Yes. Uh, what Professor Mearsheimer has to say. Um, I, I think, obviously, he has far more experience being on a college campus and thinking about these issues than I do. Um, but, yeah, I, I think that there's a lot of truth in that. And I think it really hits at kind of the pervasiveness of the problem. How much concern have you ever had in a classroom based on what you knew the professor thought? I frankly haven't been too worried about that. Um, granted, I think if I was an actual conservative, I might be a little more concerned. But I think I haven't been too worried about that. Maybe... Maybe I should have been, but I, I think I have a pretty solid trust in my own academic abilities and my own belief that if I make a good argument and I write a good essay, I will do well in the class. And in my experience, that's been the case. I've I never have I, I haven't had any evidence that I've been penalized academically for things I have said or for arguments I've made in papers. Um, Granted, there does seem to be a lot of students certainly report fear that they will get lower grades for what they say in class. But again, I think those students probably have far more controversial political beliefs than I do. How would you rate your professors over the last four years in the classroom uh, as uh, to whether or not they give you a balanced view of the world? I think they've generally been pretty good. I've really loved most of the professors I've had at UVA. Um, you know, I, I think in terms of getting a balanced view of the world, it, it that is more challenging or, you know, more pressure to do or not do that, depending on the class. You know, I I, I uh, concentrate in medieval and Renaissance studies and my English class. I don't think there's too much uh, in a medieval literature class uh, about, say, like modern political struggles that, that would somehow come up as being relevant. Um and so I, I think overall I've been very happy. You know, this is an issue that, while I understand concern about it coming from professors, I think largely, um, at, at least in the way I've experienced it, is more of a problem with the culture of students in particular. I found that professors most of the time just want to teach. Um, and if there is this kind of, like, outsized emotional reaction to something in their class, and again, this is just my experience with the professors that I've had, they, they mostly just want to get back to the topic at hand. Um, but, of course, I, I understand there, there have certainly been reports of that not necessarily being the case, but I think I've been very fortunate to have a lot of really wonderful professors at UVA that I was very lucky to have. You say in your op-ed piece from March, professors have noticed a shift in their classrooms. Brad Wilcox, a sociology professor here, told me that he believes that two factors have caused self-censorship's pervasiveness. First, students are afraid of being called out on social media by their peers, he said, and second, the dominant messages students hear from faculty, administrators, and staff are progressive ones. So they feel an implicit pressure to conform to those messages in classroom and campus conversations and debates. Do you have any idea where Professor Wilcox uh, is on the political spectrum? Um, I mean, just I, I don't know him personally, but I follow his Twitter. And from what I read, he seems to be kind of a principled conservative he does a lot of research into sociology relating to families, for example. Um, and, and that's not to say that's necessarily a conservative thought, but a lot of his research, for example, shows that two-parent households are better than one-parent households in terms of the attainment of the children, et cetera. Um, but, yeah, I, I understand where he I, – I think he, he hit on something accurate in terms of identifying the problem there as well. Viewpoint diversity is no longer considered a sacred core value in higher education, Samuel Abrams, a political professor at Sarah Lawrence, told me. Why did you interview him, and what's the point there on viewpoint diversity? 
So there are kind of two main reasons why I interviewed him. Number one, because he, he uh, the fire interns last semester ended up doing a lot of research assistance type uh, jobs for him over the summer. We did a lot of kind of data gathering for um, some research that he's currently doing. And so he was a professor that I knew because I needed to kind of reach out to people. And he himself has had the experience of um, a so-called kind of cancellation uh, for his political beliefs. Professor Abrams identifies as a conservative as well. And um, a few years ago, I don't remember off the top of my head, though I do believe it is in the essay. Um, I don't exactly remember when this happened. But um, so students at Sarah Lawrence tried to get him fired. They tried to get his tenure reviewed um, for something that he said in, um, I can't remember if it was an email to students. I don't want to say something and end up saying something false here. Um, but yeah, a lot of students tried to get him fired. Um, and Thankfully, that ended up not happening, but he got kind of the milk toast, the way he views a lot of kind of milk toast support from um, the administration. And so I, I both wanted to talk to a professor who is interested in these kind of free speech issues. He writes about it a lot. He studies it a lot, um, kind of especially in relation to campuses. But it was also particularly valuable to speak to someone who experienced this exact kind of thing uh, firsthand. What does it matter to students at the University of Virginia that this university was founded by Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. Oh, it is always a topic of controversy. Um, there is always a significant number of students who want the university to tear down statues of Thomas Jefferson, to erase any mention of him in what we do. Um, and there's always a contingency of students who think that you know, despite a lot of really horrible actions, um, Thomas Jefferson is also a founding father who we should honor as one of the founders of this university who wrote a lot of really brilliant pieces of political theory that still form the government that we have today. And it's this kind of constant debate. Sometimes it's a really productive and interesting debate. Sometimes it's a really destructive debate. But in the time I've been at UVA, it has been kind of one of the dominant like political questions, controversies about the University of Virginia itself at the University of Virginia. James Madison, one of those known to be responsible for the Bill of Rights, the First Amendment. Uh, does that matter to anybody? And what do a lot of students that are active on campus think of this First Amendment? So I think in terms of James Madison, frankly, that's just less of a political concern. I think part of it is that the university, you know, we're not called Mr. Madison's university. Um, so I, I think because of the kind of overwhelming nature of Jefferson, Jefferson, Jefferson at UVA, the discussion of Thomas Jefferson just takes way more significance. I've never really, at least in my experience, I've never heard particular discussion of Madison himself. Maybe that happened once or twice and I just forgot, but it certainly hasn't had this kind of sweeping effect in the way discussions of Jefferson has. And in terms of what students think of the First Amendment, um, I think a lot of students don't know that much about it. You know, they, they and this is kind of a big issue that, that Fires worked on as well, is that a lot of students don't know their rights. Um, a lot of students know, okay, we have a freedom of speech, but then if you ask them, well, is hate speech illegal? They'll say, oh, yeah, of course it is. No, it isn't. You know, actually, there was a particularly egregious example of this just last week at Yale University Law School, where a bunch of law students at one of the best law schools in the country um, tried to stop a, a event, a bipartisan event on free speech by doing a heckler's veto, which is not, in fact, protected by the First Amendment. Yet, when an administrator got up and said, you know, we have free expression and you cannot, you cannot use your First Amendment right to prevent someone else from exercising theirs physically. You cannot stop someone from speaking by shouting them down. They went, this is protected by the First Amendment. This is free speech. And that's just false. That's not true. Um, and so I, I think a big issue is that a lot of people don't really know what the First Amendment protects. They don't realize how much it protects. They don't realize how specific exceptions to the First Amendment are. So often think incitement of violence. Oh, is that saying, you know, I wish bad things would happen to people or kind of a rhetorical hyperbole about killing someone. It's like, no, as it turns out, in order to have incitement of violence that is not protected by the First Amendment, you pretty much have to stand up in front of a mob and say, you need to go hurt this person. And then the mob usually has to go and hurt that person in order for that to, in order for a court not to side with you. Um, and so I think the biggest problem is that people don't know that much about it. Um, and so I think that leads to a lot of kind of 
inaccurate um, interpretations of it or opinions of it. You said earlier that you were on a group chat of 3,000 students? I believe so. It might be a little bit more. It might be a little bit less. It's called Free Food and Merch. So it's, it's a chat where most of the time the discussion is there are free T-shirts here. Someone's giving away free cookies here. So that's why there are so many people in it. So they don't all go online and talk to each other and debate. No, it's mostly the the function of this group is mostly to talk about like a place where you can get like free cookies. <laughs> all right. Back to your op-ed piece. You write, <laughs> I protested a university policy about the size of signs allowed on dorm room doors by mounting a large sign of the First Amendment. It was removed by the university. In response, I worked with administrators to create a less restrictive policy. As a columnist for the university paper, I implored students to embrace free expression. In response, I lost friends and faced a Twitter pile-on. I have been brave, and yet without support, the activism of a few students like me changes little. Comment. So that kind of section is sort of a response to there was a um, an op in the New York Times from a professor. I don't remember at what college or the professor's name, basically stating that um, maybe it was Wesleyan. Maybe it was Wesleyan. I don't quite remember. Either way, um, basically saying that the problem of self-censorship is that students are not brave enough, right, that they won't just say what they think in class. And basically the, the response, this section is sort of responding to that objection a little bit, which is saying you know, putting aside all of the outside social backlash that students face for saying what they think is true, even if you do, in fact, do that, if the culture isn't on your side, not that much changes, right? You know, I feel like I, I really don't self-censor that much at all. I probably self-censor the least out of anyone else that I know on campus. Um, and not much has changed, right? There, not Not much has has changed at all. The culture hasn't really moved with me. You know, when I do my First Amendment activism at UVA, you know, I get a lot of people who roll their eyes or who only support me because they think I'm doing it in support of a political agenda instead of kind of as a principled stand for civil liberties. Um, and so it, it's really a, not a problem that can be solved by a couple individual students going against the grain. I also don't really think it can be changed by university administrators either. They can certainly do things to make it better. But I think, and this is true of a lot of kind of cultural problems, you can't really make people change their minds. You hope they do. You hope you can persuade them to change their minds about a topic. But fundamentally, if a problem is there because of certain beliefs that people have, there really isn't an easy solution to that problem. What organizations have you joined on the University of Virginia campus? Um, I've joined several, but the one that I am most involved in and the one that I spend pretty much all of my social time in at UVA is called the Jefferson Literary and Debating Society. It's the oldest organization at UVA, and it is the aforementioned debate club. Although, frankly, it isn't really a debate club in the way people would think. We're not a debate team. We basically have meetings every Friday. There's going to be one in a couple hours, actually, um, where we get together and people give speeches or they have debates. Actually, tonight there's going to be a panel um, with several members of the society on this very article that I wrote. And we're going to talk about free speech together. Um, and sometimes there are comedic presentations. So I've, I've seen presentations on whether the Kool-Aid man is the jug or the juice metaf metaphysically. And then presentations on you know, really important uh, international relations issues. And it's a really interesting, wonderful club. And the nice thing about it is that it does have this fundamental commitment to ideological diversity. We have um, a motto that we all say together at the beginning of every year or every semester, and it's um, opinions springing out of solitary observation and reflection are seldom at first instance correct. That's part of it. And that is kind of the fundamental commitment of this organization. So you have people with a full range of political beliefs. And I think it's really exciting and, and really engaging to have so many people that I can disagree with so much, but that I still count among my dearest friends. And so I really adore that about my um, experience at UVA. And it's probably my favorite thing about my experience at UVA. The Daily Cavalier, your newspaper there. Anybody read it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think people read the Cavalier Daily quite a lot, um, especially the opinion articles. Those often get a lot of circulation. 
What's the article? And I've been on your newspaper uh, website and seen some of your articles. But over time, which article that you've written has gotten the most reaction? Oh, definitely the one. I believe the headline for that is um, the left should embrace free speech again. The one basically making a an argument um, in favor of embracing free speech and kind of expressing my what the thing that troubles me so much about um, left leaning college students seeming to cast aside a commitment to free speech. That one got a lot of attention, <laughs> got a lot of negative attention. Um, but I very much stand by what I said there. You know, I think especially among kind of leftists who really are kind of going against the grain of kind of the popular Democrat Republican dichotomy. I don't really understand why someone who has any sort of vaguely radical political belief wants the government to have the power to decide whether or not they can say what they believe to be true. That seems like a terrible idea. It seems like, um, guys, why, are, why do you want the government to have this power? Because they will very quickly turn it against you. Also, just, you know, the liberal principles of free expression, I think, are really important for everyone to hold. But I do think there is a particular argument you can make for the left wing in particular to adopt free speech. But, of course, it was widely castigated among a lot of UVA students. But, you know, that's why the article was necessary to write. If there wasn't any disagreement with it, then it would mean that I did not identify a problem that actually existed. Do you have any sense of why liberals trust government so much? I don't know. Um, I think part of it is that um, I, I think that it's difficult to. I, I, I think that there's like the the label of liberal is so broad, right? So I think that if you go to the far end, like leftists, they do not trust the government that much. Some people claim to be leftists do, but I, I think part of why they do is that they think that there are governmental solutions to social problems. And that there are governmental solutions to many of our problems. And, you know, the reason why there are these social ills, they can be fixed with the right government program, the right government initiative, the right law. And I just don't, I, while I identify as a liberal, I don't fundamentally agree with that because maybe this is a bit cynical of me, but I don't really trust anyone who has such a large ego that they think they should run the country or they think they should have a say in it. Um, I don't trust their motivations fully, and I also don't trust the power of a very small number of people over a very large number of people. And so I think the best solution is to have a maximally free people, right? Um, and I think that um, you know a lot of liberals say, this is the, the world I want to live in, and if I can't convince people to adopt this belief ideologically, I can sufficiently punish them for not adopting this belief ideologically. I think a good example of this is the massive push towards um, vaccine mandates, even ones that are unnecessary. The one I'm thinking of is, I believe, I don't know if it has been struck down, but there was an attempt at the very least of a vaccine mandate for all schools, public and private in Washington, D.C., for children. And, you know, uh, based on the public health data, children are not really at risk for COVID. Vaccinating them is not strictly necessary for their health yet you know liberals have this belief no we should all get vaccinated this is part of the public health effort that we do you know we, we need to take this seriously are mandating essentially that other people kind of adopt that belief themselves and i don't necessarily think that's the best way to go so on campus uh, do you live as an independent or do you have you joined a sorority I am not joined a sorority. I currently live on the lawn at UVA, which is kind of the original um, dorms of the university. I'm actually, I can look at my door right now and see the rotunda. Is there a difference between being a Greek and being an independent from your observations over the last three and a half years? I don't think I'm really the best person to answer that question. I'm not involved in Greek life. I have a few friends that used to be in sororities, but... You know, I've never stepped foot in a fraternity or a sorority in my life, so I don't really know. Is there a reason for that? Not particularly. I think it just isn't for me, per se. What do you think of the administration of the University of Virginia? I generally like them. I think they can certainly be better at a lot of things. I am, as, you, as is probably evident by my resistance of their policies, 
I don't think they always make the right calls, but you know, I'm, I'm also willing to work with them to make things better. So I think in some ways they get a bit of a bad rap among students. I think why this happens is probably a little bit of the, you know, young adult desire to fight the man. <laughs> and so no matter what the university administration does, there will be a large number of students who despise them. But I think generally they do a good job. You know, again, I don't always agree with all their policies, but I think considering all of the different interests they have to appease, um, I think they overall do a pretty good job. I certainly have a lot of respect for President Ryan, our university's president. In your um, op-ed piece in the New York Times, you wrote, universities should refuse to cancel controversial speakers or cave to unreasonable student demands. They should encourage professors to reward intellectual diversity and nonconformism in classroom discussions. And most urgently, they should discard restrictive speech codes and bias response teams that patholo pathologize ideological conflict. Why? Well, I think that's really all that we can do for this problem. And I think that if universities want their campuses to be places of rich and rigorous discussion, their policies need to allow that to exist. So, for example, these speech codes, a lot of colleges, including public colleges, will openly say that they will discipline you for doing things that are well within your First Amendment rights. Bias response teams are essentially places that um, students can report each other for, with bias incidents, um, essentially being offensive. UVA sort of has one, but it will only respond to illegal harassment. So speech that is not, in fact, protected by the First Amendment, as far as I'm aware. Um, but a lot of schools, and um, this is particularly to a kind of liberal private colleges, will have a little portal that if someone commits what you perceive to be a microaggression against you, you can report them for punishment, which I think is a terrible idea. What that says to students is that if someone does something that makes you feel bad, that hurts your feelings, that offends you, you are not capable of handling that yourself, right? Of saying to the person, you said something I find really offensive, or you said something that really hurt me and is not, you know, something I don't think is acceptable to say. And like having a discussion with that person about it instead, no, 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 go to an adult, even though you yourself are an adult, go to an adult, go to an authority and let them handle it, right? It's the equivalent of tattling to the teacher when you're a child, right? And I think that's really bad for encouraging college students to become independent adults. Some final questions about you. Uh, go back over your life from uh, growing up in the South, coming to the University of Virginia, which is really still the South. But what over those years influenced you the most, either people or events or something you've learned from where you've lived? Um, I, I think I really have to credit a lot of my development as an intellectual person with my family, particularly my, my dad and my stepdad. Um, both of them, like I remember as a kid sitting around the table and my dad and my grandfather would talk politics a lot. But the thing is, even when I was really young, I was sort of allowed to pipe in as well, even though I'm sure I said things that made no sense because I was, you know, in third grade. But I was always kind of involved in these type of discussions from a very young age. And then with my, my stepfather in particular, I think he was really the first adult that took me seriously as an intellectual interlocutor. I remember he would drive me to and from school. And we would sometimes have, he, he was a philosophy major as well, and um, we would have these like long protracted debates where, you know, he didn't, he didn't go easy on me because I was in eighth grade. Like he, we really had these really like rich, interesting arguments. And I sometimes got a little bit upset from them because, you know, I was young and I didn't quite know how to handle someone disagreeing with me fully yet, not in the way that I do now. But you know what? Like I learned, I learned to deal with having these disagreements that sometimes upset me a bit. And it, it's so funny, you know, we'd walk in and we'd be kind of arguing and my mom would go, oh, you guys stop fighting. And we'd both go, we're not fighting. And it would be these like wonderful, I, I have very good memories of these things. And so I, I really credit and I'm really thankful that I had family, um, you know, particularly my dad and my stepdad who treated me as kind of serious interlocutors from a young age. And I think it prepared me more than most to be able to handle and have kind of rich discussions on a wide range of topics best political book you've ever read oh um 
I really enjoyed, so there are so many that I read, I feel like it's hard to say best, but I think the one that I have read recently that I have remained thinking about for a very long time is a book called Female Chauvinist Pigs by Ariel Levy, and she wrote it in the early 2000s. Um, But it's sort of about, so I'm a women's studies minor, and it's sort of about this development in feminism that has gone basically in which what is now labeled as feminist is women kind of treating themselves as sexual objects um, and that being perceived as empowering, whereas kind of old school feminism would find that kind of horrifying. You know, old school, you know, feminists in the 70s protested the Miss America pageant. Now it's seen as very feminist to win the Miss America pageant. And I think the book gives a lot of pointed critiques of, a, of current form of feminism that is currently I'd say taking the most like pop cultural power that I, I share a lot of criticisms of, but I think it was just a really interesting kind of rich book to read. And I really enjoyed it. And I think about it all the time in the week since I've read it. When you get up every day, where do you go for your news? I have a subscription to the New York times and the Washington post. So I read that. I also read reason and as terrible as it sounds, I do look at Twitter because unfortunately it has, an immediacy, of course, that means that it has an unreliability to it as well. But I, I very unfortunately <laughs> spend probably too much time on Twitter. Looking back on your experience of having an op-ed piece on the New York Times uh, editorial page, uh, what's that experience been like overall? And how hard was it to write this particular essay? And how many different people did you pass it through until it uh, got to the paper? was a really wonderful experience. Um, I kept in touch with that one editorial assistant through the whole process. It was a five-month process. So I first made the pitch, and the pitch was accepted in October, and it just got published about, what, a week, two weeks ago. Um, and so that was, um, it was a really interesting experience. It was a really valuable experience as a very young journalist to see all the layers of editing that go into these widely shared op-eds on, you know, the kind of most read news pages. Um, it had a lot of iterations going into it. You know, the essay that I turned in as my first draft in October is very different from the essay that ended up being published. It's also very different from the essay that, you know, the, the essay that I signed the contract, you know, while it, while it was in, it's about 500 words um, shorter now that the essay ended up being published. Um, and so it was a really valuable experience. I really trust and appreciate the uh, editing and advice of the New York Times staff. Um, as far as I'm, I'm aware, I got edits from, I worked a lot with that editorial assistant, then there was another person above her, and then I believe there's another person above her. Maybe there's a few more layers that I either forgot about or didn't notice. Um, but yeah, it was a really involved process, but it was a really good experience, and I'm glad that I had it. Anything they wouldn't let you put in the piece? Um, I... I think a detail, I, hmm, I mean, there were some things, I I wouldn't describe much that got cut out as not being let put in the piece. I think of that more as we only have 1,200 words. We have to pick the things that support the argument in the best way that they possibly can. Um, I do think a detail, and granted, I don't know if this was cut out because of fact checking, as the professor in question resisted this framing, but something that did get cut out that I wish was let in. Um, when Abby Sachs, one of the people I, I uh, quoted, was discussing an experience in a class where she said something that caused kind of a dog pile, and she discusses feeling kind of not really wanting to go to class anymore, or feeling kind of bad or awkward about that, a detail that was in her interview that I put in the piece that ended up getting cut out was that she she reported the professor not calling on her anymore, almost never calling on her in class again. And that was a detail that did not make it in. And I wish it did, because I think it would have given a lot more power to that particular anecdote. So I think I'll say that. Did the Times check with the quotes in your piece by going to the individuals you're quoting? Um, So I sent them, so a lot of the quotes I got were I sent questions in an email, and so I just forwarded the email to the Times in question. One of them, so for Stephen, that was in an interview that I interviewed him with a voice memo on my phone. I sent that voice voice memo. 
Um, I think for professors in question, I, I don't know for sure. I presume they did, but no one like CC'd me on the email or anything. I presume there was fact. I know there was fact checking done with the university administration just to say, hey, we're publishing this. Here are the claims that are being made. And so I, I'm sure that probably happened with the professors who who were not named, but involved in some of the anecdotes being given. Um, so I, I, they, they do a good job of fact checking. I'll attempt at making this be the last question. Where will Emma Camp be at age 35? I hope still writing. Um, really, what I what I hope to be doing is writing things that are of interest to me and interest to other people, um, and hopefully with a family that I'm really grateful for and really happy to have. Emma Camp, University of Virginia, soon to graduate. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. Please rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org.